Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. One of the most important innovations in the history of the National Football League occurred in February of 1936 when the NFL initiated its very first draft of collegiate players. It was a revolutionary concept. Each team, beginning with the one with the worst record, to the best from the previous season would be able to secure the sole rights to negotiate with a specific player that the team had selected. Burt Bell of the Philadelphia Eagles, who had later proved to be a visionary leader as the commissioner of the NFL, has been rightfully credited with the idea of instituting the draft. Perhaps not ironically though, the Eagles also possessed the worst position in the standings from the 1935 season. Beginning in 1936, Bell's brainchild would now override the previous wide open recruitment of college athletes. Previously, the top gritters would sign with the highest bidder or perhaps one that offered the best chance of football success or perhaps an opportunity in the business world. Teams like the Bears and the Giants traditionally had helped themselves to the finest graduating seniors. The first NFL draft was staged in rather modest conditions in comparison with today's multi-day extravaganza. Held at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Philadelphia on February 8, 1936, the draft lasted just nine rounds and was over in one day. At the time, the league consisted of only nine teams and the team representatives helped compile a list of 90 names that were etched onto a blackboard in the meeting room. In other words, there was no scouting, no opulent entertainment of potential top picks, and no rude demands from glittering agents, and no NFL combine. Just a small group of football executives hoping to improve their lot in life by selecting nine players that they may or may not have ever heard about. Emerging as a top pick was a speedy halfback from the University of Chicago named Jay Berwanger. Born March 19, 1914, he was the son of a blacksmith in Dubuque, Iowa, and the first winner in 1935 of what would become known as the Heisman Trophy. Berwanger never played football until he was an end at Jefferson Junior High School in Dubuque, and he later told the Chicago Daily News, I guess that was when I first began to get some idea of what real football is, but I didn't really learn until I got into senior high school. While in high school in Dubuque, Berwanger switched from end to halfback and quickly impressed his coaches by scoring a touchdown as a sophomore against rival Cedar Rapids. Coach Wilbur Danzel saw the potential in the quick 150-pound back, stating, Here was a boy who at age 15 was a rarity of football, who could run as well to his left as he could to his right, a willing kid who could punt and pass, who could learn rapidly and who could run like the wind. Above all, here was a youngster who loved to play. Berwanger improved each season, grew to 170 pounds, and led his team to the state title as a senior. After high school, he was steered to the University of Chicago by former Maroon Ira Davenport, a 1912 graduate, and then the president of the Dubuque Boat and Boiler Works. I wanted to go to college, said Berwanger. Secondly, I wanted to play football, but I wanted to take my football at school where I could balance it with some pretty serious work in the education business. That came first, my education. The Chicago Tribune later noticed his arrival on campus by stating, Jay arrived in a cattle truck, smelling of hay and hogs, astonishing the members of his chosen fraternity. He arrived on the Chicago campus in the fall of 1932, which would prove to be the last season under legendary coach Amos Alonzo Stagg. 
Stagg was at Chicago from 1892 through 1932 and won two national championships. However, the glory years were well behind Stagg by the time Berwanger showed up. It was his last year there, recalled Berwanger to the Fort Worth Star. He was a fine person and a great coach. His teams had legendary battles with fielding Yost teams at Michigan, and he was winning championships when Newt Rockney was a child. In fact, when I was there, I think Chicago had still won more Big Ten titles than any other school. But they hadn't won one in a while. His varsity debut as a sophomore in 1933 was a scorcher, according to the Chicago Daily News, which said, A flashing demon in an iron mask, he tore through and over and around the Cornell College line for four touchdowns, kicked two points after touchdown, and brought the greatest joy of a decade to the faithful flowers of the maroons. Berwanger was one of the first to use what we might call a face mask, which he wore to protect a broken nose. Thus the description of the flying demon in the iron mask. Wearing this unusual mask, however, he never did re-injure his nose during his collegiate career. With the Maroons, he was known as Chicago's one-man team. He agreed with that assessment, saying, In those days, I played defense, did all the passing and punting, and a lot of the running. In my senior year, I also had to call the signals because right before the season started, our quarterback got married and quit school. During his career at the University of Chicago, Berwanger picked up 1,839 yards and 439 carries for a 4.2 average. He completed 50 passes for 921 yards and scored 152 points on 22 touchdowns and 20 extra points. As a senior in 1935, he was clearly one of the top players in the country, and the Chicago Tribune awarded him its Silver Football Award, Symbolic, but the most valuable player in the Big Ten. But there was one more honor that found its way to De Berwanger in late 1935. He received a telegram from the New York Athletic Club inviting him to New York to receive a trophy honoring him as the, quote, most valuable player east of the Mississippi River, unquote. A year later, the award was renamed as the Heisman Trophy, but Berwanger was the first to receive this revered honor. In 1985, he said, it wasn't really a big deal when I got it. I was more excited about the trip to New York than the trophy because it was my first airplane flight. Many consider Berwanger to be the model for the current Heisman Trophy figurine. In 1998, he provided some thoughts on that subject by saying, well, it's documented that they used some players in New York to pose for that trophy. I've always thought that it looks a lot like a picture that ran of me in, in the debut paper one time, but I've never really pushed it. Next up for the football world was the first NFL draft held the following February. No one was quite sure how this whole thing would work out, but Berwanger was asked about his possible future in professional football, and he replied, I haven't made up my mind as of yet, he said regarding the draft. I've had several good business offers that I'm inclined to think about. He was also in training with the University of Chicago track team with an eye on possibly competing for a spot on the United States Olympic team later that year. When the first NFL draft opened for business on February 8, 1936, the initial name selected was as expected, Jay Berwanger of the University of Chicago. However, the Philadelphia Eagles, who had that pick, were concerned about Berwanger's rumored demand of $1,000 per game and almost immediately traded his rights to the Chicago Bears. It would seem to be a no-brainer for George Hallis to secure the services of the local college player to prop up his Chicago Bears backfield. But first, Berwanger made it a point to deny that crazy rumor about money, indicating that in no way had he demanded $1,000 an outing. In the end, Berwanger never signed a contract to play pro football. As the first player ever selected in the NFL draft, what happened? Oddly enough, George Hellis does not even mention Jay Berwanger in his autobiography. So our main source of information on this elusive topic is the man himself. A couple of versions have surfaced over the years and they differ slightly but agree on one key point. Hellas and Berwanger only met once, could not agree on money, and the topic was dropped forever. No negotiations, no back and forth, and no contract demands. 
1977, the Associated Press published this version of that discussion. There was Berwanger and Hallis facing each other in separate chairs in the lobby of the Sherman Hotel in Chicago. Jay knew what he wanted to make. George knew what he wanted to spend. It was as simple as that, said Berwanger. I want a no-cut contract at $12,500 a year. Alice replied, Balderdash! Take it or leave it, said Berwanger. Well, Alice said, we have nothing more to discuss. Papa Bear arose and strode away. The pro career of the one-man team, which had never started, had ended. But Berwanger went right into business and became a millionaire. As for Berwanger, he coached the freshman team at the University of Chicago, became a columnist for the Chicago Daily News, and found employment in the business world with a sponge rubber manufacturer. He served as a flight instructor during World War II, but when the war ended, he discovered that his job at the manufacturing plant was no longer available. So, he said, I started my own company called J. Berwanger Incorporated. In the 1990s, he sold his company, which by then was doing over $30 million in annual sales. He did stay close to football, however, by becoming a respected college referee, even being part of the crew at the 1949 Rose Bowl. Overall, the original NFL draft went off without a hitch and has continued to grow since 1936. It increased to 10 rounds in 1937 and has now become a three-day pairing of player scrutiny and an entertainment extravaganza. Of the original 81 players selected in 1936, it appears that less than 30 actually played in the NFL. However, four players from that first draft are now honored with places in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. They are Dan Fortman and Joe Steidehar of the Bears, Tuffy Lehmans of the Giants, and Wayne Milner of Washington. So, you may ask, did the 1935 Heisman Trophy winner and the first draft pick ever in the NFL ever play football again? Of course! We found that Berwanger became a member of the Calumet, Indiana Gunners All-Stars in 1937 and even played in an exhibition game against the aforementioned Chicago Bears where his role was largely limited to punting. But he never did appear in an NFL game despite his lofty collegiate accolades. Thank you for joining us for this episode of When Football Was Football on the Sports History Network. On the next program, we'll take you back to the early 1950s when a group of neighborhood friends who love the Cardinals from the south side of Chicago outwitted the fiscally tight George Hellas to secure a memento that still has an impact on their families today. And you might want to consider joining us at this year's conference of the Pro Football Researchers Association, which will be held June 25th to 27th at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. I'll be part of a panel discussion that will talk about the birth of the NFL, but that's only the tip of the iceberg for the information-packed schedule for football fans of all ages. And we hope to see you there. For more information, simply look up the Pro Football Researchers Association and follow the links. Thank you. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. The 2021 Professional Football Researchers Association Convention will be held at the Gold Jacket Lounge at the Pro Football Hall of Fame during the final weekend of June. Convention speakers will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the NFL. The fee for the convention is $50 for members and $100 for non-members. The fee includes admission to the convention and Pro Football Hall of Fame, meals on Friday evening and Saturday afternoon, and free parking. All convention activities are subject to COVID-19 protocols. For more details, Details, click on the 2021 PFRA convention link at profootballresearchers.org. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. 
Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.